I'd like to begin the program today uh, by introducing a couple of groups that are here visiting us. The first, of course, being our chorus from Indio High School. Thank you for coming out today. And also our color guard for today, that's the JROTC Marines from Desert Hot Springs High School. And speaking of those, uh, if you all please rise for the presentation of our colors. If you're a veteran of the armed services, will you please remain standing while the rest may be seated? I can see that. We thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. A few other thank yous today. Before we get started with the program, of course, I always make sure to thank our volunteer staff here at the uh, Palm Springs Air Museum. Our board members, and of course, all museum members. If you're here today and are not a member of the Palm Springs Air Museum, please do consider it. It is the membership of this museum that makes it all possible, from the hangars to the planes, to the exhibits, to the programs, if you're not a member, please do consider it because it is very important that Palm Springs Air Museum continues its mission, mission to preserve, educate, and honor. Thank you. I would like to also thank one special person today. If you look in your programs, you'll see a lot of sponsors for these 65th programs. But today, James Houston has gone above and beyond to become a major sponsor. I would like to thank James Houston. Thank you.
65 years. It's been 65 years since the end of World War II. These programs we have this season are commemorating those 65 years and also commemorating and remembering those who served and won that war for us. Today's program focuses on the events from D-Day leading up to VE Day, the end of the war in Europe. We're gonna go ahead and start now by talking about a little bit of a lead up into D-Day. D-Day of course took place June 6th, 1944, and that was, as I think we all know, the major Allied offensive going into northern France, striking back at what was then held by the Germans, northern France. The major groups taking part in that offensive, the British, the Americans, and the Canadians. The planning was impeccable. Did it go perfect? Absolutely not. It was delayed, it was delayed. Those that took part in it, I'm sure, uh, got very anxious, wondering when was it going to take place. The buildup was tremendous. How do you hide? How do you hide the buildup? Uh, you've got troops, you've got supplies, you've got everything necessary for an invasion of such a huge and tremendous scale. And all this has to go on basically just across the English Channel from occupied France, under Hitler's nose practically. But they managed to do it. Now Hitler knew that there was going to be an invasion, but he never was able to discover where. Seemingly, it was going to be at the Pas de Calais, the shortest distance in between England, if we look up at the map here, and France, but it didn't take place there. It took place at Normandy. We're aware of the beaches, Utah, Omaha, Juneau, Gold, Sword, but we also have to remember that there was a some activities that went on before the landings on the beaches. The paratroopers were in there first. The 101st Airborne and of course the 82nd Airborne. They came by parachute and also if we notice over here, they came by glider. And that was in the wee small hours of the morning before the boats had landed. We're gonna start our program off today by honoring a very special gentleman and by hearing from a very special gentleman who was there on that day. Mr. Otis Sampson is here with us. He just recently celebrated his 100th birthday. And in just a moment, I'd like to ask Otis to tell us a little bit about it. But before we do that, there's been a program that was put together some time back in collaboration between the Palm Springs Air Museum and KESQ uh, Channel 3 Television. It's only a few minutes long. But this will give you a little introduction to Otis, and this is a fact in his own words. So we're going to go ahead and start with that, and then we'll uh, hear from the man himself in person. Give me just a moment to start the video. Second time I was wounded, the bullet went through my right buttock and up into my stomach. I got another one across here and one across up in here. Everything, everything was getting black. And then I said, what the hell? What the hell am I giving up this easy for? And I started shaking my head, trying to clear the blackness. I gave myself a shot of morphine to kill the pain. O'Loughlin came out there and dragged me in the cellar. My name is Otis L. Sampson. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. I made four combat jumps. Sicily, Italy, Normandy, and Holland. And this is my story. The 82nd, having captured the Dom Air and secured the bridge head across the Manta, destroyed other river crossings, protected the flank of the 7th Army Corps, and drove west to the New River. 
I used to be in the horse cavalry in 1930 when Pearl Harbor was born, and I wanted to get right back in the service. And then I see a little ad in the paper, join the paratroopers, and that's what I wanted. It was a, a new way of warfare, and I figured that I was made for it. The boys, they couldn't wait to get in the get to action. Took off, he flew low, crossed the uh, islands, came into Normandy, and I looked down they were shooting all right. So I jumped pretty high, and the wind, wind was blowing pretty strong to my back. And I tried to drop to, for a head throw, but cut across. I tried to drop down there, and I landed just in the bottom of the trees. Over St. Mary Place, they got quite a few of our boys, because we landed right above the Germans. Some got shot coming down, and others got shot in the trees, because it was all tangled up in them, you know. You just hope that you get hit the ground and get fighting. You never worried about getting hit. You didn't have time, let's put it that way. We got organized and got a position, and we went into St. Mary Glace. And that's where I saw so many of the boys hanging in trees where they'd been killed. Well, the position I was put, I had the top of me and to the left of me to protect with seven men. And all these Germans came in, I thought, sure, with I'd never see daylight again. But they never crossed the hedge road. Then the night came on. The Germans came in, came in on us. And then they withdrew and left us to their artillery. And the rest of the night, that's what we broke we up against. Morning came, we went, went down to Nouvelle Plain, withdrew this lieutenant. He had lost. 12 of his men, and pretty well wiped out the Germans was surrounding them. And we came in there just in time to catch the Germans that were surrounding them. And we made a mess out of them. We withdrew with, 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 with what he had left back to St. Mary Glace. The Germans seemed to be all around the place. We came in and made the attack on them. They tried to get out from under the shells that I was landing. Then they tried to find a way away, and where they went, I brought the mortar and played there, and got them, and we wiped out a battalion of them. Then, when the ammunition was all gone, I had my tongue gun, and it was killing me so easy. I had some three or four Germans in my sight, and my fingers came to a complete stop. I just couldn't kill anymore. It was about ready to attack us. And they wasn't ready, so we caught them off balance and wiped out that battalion. All those boys that got killed, and they'd never see them anymore. And then, just before they buried them, they tried to get all the, all the paratroopers together to show how many we had. And the dead were there too. That was a sad moment to see all those boys right out there. It was just a short time. Before they'd been alive, it gave us something to fight for. Well, it was a long day from the time of daybreak until nightfall. Many towns were taken and lost, many men were killed. We made a big showing in Normandy. Each outfit had their battles the beach and the fighter planes, tanks. Each had his, his job to do. We had ours. 25 years after the war, we made the, the trip. Looking over the battlefields and like that, and finding them again, and what happened here, and what happened there. But it's kind of hard to say just how you did feel. It was nice to be with the boys again. I guess I can look at it that way. Think of the many people died for the freedom we have today. Freedom will never come cheap.
Freedom will never come cheap. Any truer words are impossible, I think. Otis, how you doing? It was my pleasure. I've seen a lot of it. And I was very glad to be in the airborne. It's part of my life. Amen. Yeah. Otis, if I could prevail upon you a little bit, when I, I mentioned this afternoon when you came in, you told me just a little bit about your father and the training that he gave you that helped keep you alive. Would you mind sharing that? Your, your father. Fox. My father was a fox hunter, and when he was a boy, he got some kind of a sickness in his ears, and it left him hard of hearing in one ear. So, being a fox hunter, he had to know which way the dogs were barking, and he'd take me out with him at night. And. And I'd take a, sometime it would, we'd be go two or three miles away from home. And I'd be with him and then wake up in the night. Or maybe I took a jacket with me to put over me and sleep against a tree. And when I woke up, I'd have to find my way home. And it's through his teachings that I was able to do that by it's by the North Star and the moss on the north side of the tree. As nights, you know, he couldn't see the North Star. And then later on in life, it came to me one night when I was in bed, and I felt that he was there with me on those nights that I was hunting with him. And I was trained, it was inbred right in me, how to take care of myself in the woods. And not only from me, but from my men and the men that were with me. I used to do the leading. And I knew right where I was all the time. It was a big help. Amen. Thank you, Otis. Uh, I thought we better share that story. I, Otis told me that earlier today, and I thought, wow, his father was saving his life all those years before, fox hunting out there in the woods. And not only was he saving Otis's life, but he was saving all the men that were under Otis as well. So uh, I guess a, a note to the, the parents in the audience, I guess we don't always know maybe what it is that we're saying and giving and passing on, but it is important, right? Well, the story continues on from there, right? We didn't just uh, land on the beaches and jump in St. Mary Glees, but the fighting continued on. And to hear a little more about that, uh, of course, we've got Blaine Mack with us here today. He's going to continue the story on from there a little bit. Thank you, Greg. Hello up there. Out here. It was telling me to get out with the crowd. It was a long and rough road from D-Day to the end of the war in Europe. Didn't seem that way when you look at the calendar because we're talking about a total of roughly 11 months. And a lot happened in those days. And it happened everywhere. And one of the problems, as I stated earlier in a little talk I gave earlier today, 
One of the problems we always have here when we talk about World War II is that there were so many things happening in so many parts of the world at the same time that even within the confines of a small place, you didn't know everything that was going on. So we hope to bring to you uh, a little bit of the, of the stories that you may not know. Uh, this was the biggest, as we know, those of you who studied any history at all, the D-Day invasions, the Normandy invasions, and we use the term D-Day because that's a military term, for those of you don't, uh, that aren't aware of it, that uh, it's like X is equal to so, well, D is the day you do something. And that's where that phrase came from to start with. So there were a lot of D-Days, but this is one seems to hold the title above all, and the rest of them have been more or less uh, put aside, shall we say, as important as they were. So from the Normandy beachheads on, to take Germany was just an enormous task. And you've seen a little bit in there of, of what it was like just at one beachhead. And then again, it's important to remember that we had several of these. It wasn't just the one. We normally think of Omaha Beach because that was the toughest one of all. That was an American one. and. Um, why did it turn out to be the toughest? There are a lot of theories on it, but mostly it just happened. It was not planned, and I'm not sure that to this day anyone can really explain why it turned out that way. So, but we're gonna talk about a, a few of the things that happened on the road to, as we always referred to it, downtown Chicago, which was Berlin. And so from the Normandy beachheads, uh, I hope this thing's giving me a trouble here for some reason. I'll try to work it this way. As they worked their way through, they came from several different directions. And one of these directions was, was of course, directly inland from, from the beach. They, on June 6th, they started through and looped around in both directions to try to secure and to keep them from being outflanked. And they worked their way through, and some of these battles were very difficult, others went uh, a little bit easier. And as they got a little bit further in, they also started getting the uh, invasion from underneath, from, uh, from southern France. But that's a little bit later on. Things began to happen in a real big hurry. The first thing, the British broke through first of all, because for some reason their defenses that they were up against were a little bit lesser I started to say weak, and that's a horrible term to use, uh, shall we say lesser than, than ours. And then ours finally broke through a St. Lowe and, and uh, after uh, heavy losses. And an interesting thing is to think back of what went on in Eisenhower's mind, and how do we know this? Because he dropped a few remarks that were picked up. But one of those was at Omaha, when he actually, for the only time, expressed reservations and the thoughts that maybe we were gonna to have to pull our people off the beach. <coughs> and of course, he would, that's the last thing in the world he wanted to do. But they came through. And uh, so then they were able to break through to St. Louis, and at that time, the Allies invaded southern France. And right during this, while this was going on, there was an attempt on Hitler's life at a meeting. It's a long story all in itself. I won't try to go into that. I'm not sure I could recite it accurately if I did. I'm not sure anybody really knows. But there was a serious attempt made on his life in one of the meetings. It failed. And those alleged perpetrators, heavy price for that. 
So at any rate, the, uh, the handwriting was on the wall then that the Germans were in fact going to lose. But nobody, and I do mean nobody on either side, wanted to admit that. Shortly after the Allies invaded from the southern France, Paris was liberated. And one of the slides you'll see here, if I can pull it up, uh, I'm having a little trouble with this, I don't know why. It's getting tired, I think. And right here, the Americans decided that since de Gaulle was the president of France in exile, when they came out to take over France, they would allow him the honor of leading the French in to Paris. Good move? Well, yes, probably so. Uh, the French, of course, were very grateful and everything fell in line very nicely. Don't ask me to explain computers. Uh, and here we see the Americans following up, going through the uh, liberation of Paris. And at this point, they were on their way. The Germans were in, not in full retreat, but they were, in essence, with their backs against the wall. There was too much there. They've been hurt badly long before this time and did not realize it. They had been hurt badly industrially and it wasn't going to be very long before the effects of fuel shortages and those things which had been the result of strategic bombings and a lot of other things that were taking place at the same time. And all of a sudden, every bit of it was starting to catch up with them. The destruction along the way was horrendous, as you might understand. It was not an intended scorched earth policy, but when you're working with munitions like that, it can't turn out to be anything else. It's not possible. And especially when you stop and consider that these people are, the Germans I'm talking about now, are defending themselves. And how are you going to defend yourself when you're on the ground? You're going to get behind anything that will protect you. And it doesn't matter what. And in, as a result, the, everything that's protecting you is going to come down. And that's exactly what happened. I'd like to take just a minute and talk about the aircraft that were involved there. One of the problems you always have when you're going through these things is, as I, I repeat myself, and some of you heard me say this earlier this morning, but I'll say it again. Navies and air forces do not win wars. But they make it possible for the people on the ground to win them. And no one is going to make it without the others. So it is a three-way street that works perfectly. <laughs> one of the real problems that the Americans and then had in particular, but all of the Allied troops at Normandy, excuse me, and for a short time afterwards, was the lack of air support. The weather was bad. Uh, for those who haven't done this, you don't realize, perhaps, how good a weather you have to have in order to support ground troops. They have to be able to see you and know you where you are. They have to be able to direct you. You have to be able to get in and see what they're talking about. Because if you don't, it's very easy to bomb the wrong target, and it's better to not bomb at all than to bomb the wrong target or to strafe the wrong target. Shortly thereafter, the weather broke and air support started showing up in large numbers. Not all known by the people on the ground because it was going on everywhere, but it was certainly going on 
in large numbers. So we'll take just a minute and, and show you a little bit about uh, some of these aircraft that were supporting the ground troops. This is one, probably, uh, you know, the workhorse of World War II right here, the B-25, North American B-25. What a beautiful old aircraft. Tough as nails, rugged, get right down amongst them. Uh, it seemed to just almost beckon you to get in where the action was. Great airplane. By today's standards, a very small bomb load, but, but for those days, adequate. Good for ground support, for transportation disruption and that kind of thing. And this, of course, is a glory girl of all ground support aircraft of World War II. Probably the premier ground support aircraft of all, the P-47, commonly called a jug. And probably one of the most rugged airplanes that's ever been built. We have one out here uh, in our other hangar. And a little quick story about that one. Dick Parker has his name on it. Dick left us a while back. He was in Europe and was shot down seven times in that big old tank. The seventh time he shot himself down. <laughs> He came in on an ammo train and didn't know that that's what it was until he blew it up and went through it. Uh, it was amazing, the stories of this thing coming back home looking like a rag bag and still flying and flying well are legend. And for those of you who might remember the, the uh, picture Patton, and I'm sure that covers just about everybody here, at least once. Picture, if you will. He's trying to come up at this time to relieve the 101st and the Battle of Bulge. The weather's been rotten. They have not been able to do much, but that didn't slow Patton down very much. And he orders his, his uh, chaplain to go back and pray for good weather. Now that's typical Patton right there. <laughs> the next day, the next scene, they're standing on a little buff, crystal clear blue sky. He gives the uh, chaplain a commendation for bringing good weather. <laughs> that's too typical of Patton. And you see this whole mass of airplanes heading for the Ardennes, and that's what they were. This is another one of our support aircraft, and this was a beautiful machine, just did everything and did everything well. And these guys were right down in the thick of it, and there's one thing about the guys that flew these kinds of airplanes that nobody else can understand, and I don't think they do either. They'll oftentimes be very quiet, People who sit down and pitch pennies at the fair and that kind of stuff, and you, they strap that machine on them, and you don't want to tangle with them. This is the P-38, which was probably the premier all-purpose aircraft and used a lot in ground support and everything else, including photo wrecking. And we use all three of these fighters in large numbers over there to support these people on the ground. And here is where that came into play. They would have been nothing without those people on the ground. There would have been no reason for them to be there. Those people on the ground would have been nothing without them because they would not have made it. And this is the way any good team works. I thought just for, I throw this in there. I don't know why I did this. But perhaps it'll show you, you know, we talk a, long, a lot about these days about the difficulty of flying jet aircraft baloney. Take a look at that. That's the cockpit of a P-38. Everything in one of those fighters was done by the pilot. Everything. Period. There was nothing automatic except the propellers. They were the only thing. And you managed them. 
It, the handwriting was on the wall. The Allies had advanced. They were up to the Seine. They were, Paris had been liberated. Brussels had been liberated. And, and things were looking bad for the home team. The Airborne landed in Netherlands. And the Germans were trapped. Now, I gotta take a minute to talk about Hitler here because it's so important right at this point. To me, he, he is a classic case of the borderline between genius and insanity. He orders this massive counterattack when, in the dead of winter, in the Ardennes Forest, the, probably the toughest place there to fight, and a complete surprise. And the results were devastating to both sides. This is what it looked like. And at this point, Rick, would you like to tell them a little bit about the Battle of the Bulge? Well, Blaine, I'm not going to do too much talking on that because as you may or may not have guessed, I wasn't there. <laughs> but I happen to know we've got two gentlemen right up front here who, who were. And uh, whenever possible, I like to get it, no offense, gentlemen, right from the horse's mouth. So, um, I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman that we just met today. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Marilio Salivar. He was with Patton's 3rd Army that Blaine was just talking about, 99th Division. He was there at the English Channel, went to La Havre, France, to Luxembourg, to Belgium, the Battle of the Bulge. I think that's experience, don't you folks? Yeah. Let's give him just a minute. Germany. I took basic training in Houston, Texas, and that was the best training that I got. That's why I'm still here. <clears throat> when I got, <clears throat> after training, I went to Boston and got a, well, first I went to Pennsylvania. And uh, I guess I uh, got hooked up with uh, <clears throat> with the 99 division. Uh, and, and from there, I went to Boston, got on uh, Queen Mary, 15,000 troops. Uh, I'm showing you the way I went to, to Europe. Uh, <clears throat> 50,000 troops. Uh, you get in line for breakfast, maybe around 6 o'clock. And stay in line till you get fat. And get back in line for lunch. <laughs> 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 and, and get back, to, uh, stay in line, and, and, and get fat, and get in line again, right after you eat, to, to get uh, dinner. And, and that's the way for seven days on the Queen Mary. And uh, from, from uh, from there, we got uh, to Scotland, Glasgow, uh, Scotland. And no sooner we, we got on a train and got to Plymouth, uh, England. And from there, we, <coughs> we got on a ship across the English Channel. And, uh, and before we get to land, in the English Channel, we we got on a, 
Uh, it's been 65 years. And in a launcher, like they feel we're going to go attack, the, the front lines were already in. Uh, in, uh, in in uh, Belgium, yeah. and that's that's where I started fighting. No sooner I got to the 99th division, they put me in a fox show with a with a man that had experience already, and. Uh, to get to the Fox Hall, the snow was up to my waist. And, and, you, and you, can't, you couldn't get up out of that path, otherwise you get, you get lost. And uh, you stay in that Fox Hall for 24 hours with two men with a little squat stool. And, uh, and they get relief, and from there, from there, I went through. Uh, I went, I went through. He went through hell. <laughs> to me, it seemed like, uh, like uh, from there, from the Fox Hall, it was too, it was too, soon the war got over because the Germans were out of ammunition, out of food, out of clothes, and that really helped us. Really helped us. Uh, and I, I went through. A lot of people, are, our American troops weren't trained well. But they weren't trained well. Uh, I don't know why they, they, they must have not had time to train them. Because I got good training. And uh, I went all, all the way through uh, Germany. Uh, through uh, <clears throat> the Rhine River, uh, at the Rhine River, when we got there, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> we went through uh, Patoon River, uh, Patoon River, and. Uh, it, it was uh, it was very rough there because the Germans were were shooting us with uh, uh, aircraft guns and they're not effective. So that was really uh, good for us. And they were trying to. Uh, uh, the Germans were trying to uh, uh, knock down the bridge, uh, that uh, train bridge, and never could. Bridge at Remagen? Would that be the bridge at Remagen? Yeah, Raman, Raman bridge. And uh, there we got. Uh, <clears throat> A few men kill. Uh, Can I steal that back from you? I, <laughs> these are the stories that give you goosebumps, aren't they, folks? Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to one more.
Metal New Year. He was there for the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, I'd also like to commend him for coming in today all the way from Newport Beach, Mr. Marty Schlacker. I want to show this to Otis. And I want to say, all the airborne guys, when they say airborne, they say, all the way. This is a World War II airborne uniform. Never been used. Never wow. been worn. Wow. I want to show it to Otis. He's a great guy. And a survivor. <laughs> As this gentleman. I've had that ever since World War II. Take a look at that, Otis. Isn't that beautiful? We hung all of our grenades here, all of our weapons. Uh, um, the guys in baggy pants, this is the pants are in here. But anyway, can you hold that? I really respect Otis and uh, his longevity. Uh, the airborne guys are special. Uh, I joined the Airborne because I couldn't get in the Navy, because I'm colorblind. <laughs> couldn't get in the Air Force. Anyway, my, uh, I'm very proud, uh, as he was, of his father. My father came from, from uh, Russia, and uh, when he came here as a Jewish immigrant, uh, joined the military. He was in the Spanish-American War and fought with, uh, uh, with uh, the artillery. Uh, unit, and I'm very proud of him. He died in uh, Sawtell Hospital of a stroke uh, many years ago, but uh, I'll never forget my dad. He taught me everything. Anyway, uh, being airborne, I was in Fort Bend, as he was, and did all my job training. Uh, finally ended up uh, going out of uh, near Boston, like you did, but I wasn't out of Queen Mary. I was in the Wakefield. We only had 10,000 troops. <laughs> and uh, we also uh, ended up uh, waiting in line to eat and what have you. Anyway, I, I ended up in, uh, in England. Uh, we uh, were in Barton Stacy. I don't know where you were, but I was in Barton Stacy and uh, did a lot of uh, jumping there, uh, uh, combat jumps. And uh, one day, uh, this was, uh, oh, in September of uh, 1944, when this gentleman jumped into Nijmegen, I sat on an airplane for three days in reserve, got off at night, but we sat there in the parachute for three solid days uh, in reserve. We never had to jump because you guys did a marvelous job there. Kicked the hell out of the drums. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I got there uh, uh, on the December the 24th, Christmas Eve of 1944. The 17th Airborne, I belong to, was a claw uh, airborne pack. Uh, flew for the very first time on a C-47 without jumping, uh, landed in uh, uh, Reims, France, where the 101st and uh, 82nd Airborne were located. The airfield had just been uh, bombed by the Germans, and uh, we landed safely. We had uh, Christmas dinner, even for a Jewish boy, it was great. Uh, uh, the next day, we uh, did not jump into, uh, into France or Belgium. Uh, we were motor trucked in there because the weather was so bad. You saw the pictures there of all the of all the snow and what have We fought in France uh, briefly, trying to find some German paratroopers. And uh, uh, that was the 24th. On the 25th is when I went into combat. On the January the 7th, after relieving the 11th Airborne, the 11th Armored Division, at a little town called Monty in Belgium, uh, that was the first time I had the experience of, of hearing the 88 millimeter weapon go off right down through there. You guys all know World War II, the guys in Germany, uh, that was a, that weapon was fantastic. Uh, we lost a few troops there in a small town. We were there for about three days. Uh, the Germans were kicking the hell out of us. And uh, on the 6th of January, we went into the attack in the snow and ended up at a place called Death Man's Ridge. And, uh, the Germans came up that uh, that morning with 15 Tiger tanks and as many, <laughs> I never saw so many German troops, but uh, I was in a small, uh, small, uh, uh, sorry, I've got a senior moment here, uh, Belgium home. We had, uh, I was on the switchboard and uh, 
uh, never seen a switchboard before, but the colonel told me to go down there because I was in communications. And by the way, I threw my radio away, it wasn't working. Uh, the weather was so bad, it was terrible at communications. To make a long story short, uh, I was in uh, the, the front basement with about all of, about 15 wounded people, and my sergeant came over and said, hey, we're surrounded, let's get the hell out of here. So I uh, came out of the basement, and uh, my best friend uh, by the name of uh, Red Emick, uh, good Irish guy, we went in, we couldn't get out of the house because the German tanks were coming through the, the barn, and we went down into the basement. The three of us, the sergeant and two of us enlisted guys. And uh, we decided, well, how are we going to give up? Well, we didn't have much chance to uh, answer the question because it was a German soldier and the top of the grenade. The grenade looked like this thing right here. And uh, he, uh, he was at the top, he was about ready to throw it. And I, we made eye contact. I'll never forget that. He and I, and he didn't throw the grenade. He says, how many are down there in German? And being of uh, Jewish descent, I think maybe some Jew Jewish people there that know Yiddish. Uh, I understood that, and I just raised my hand three. And, uh, I said, Rasmus do. And that was the end of uh, my war, uh, combat uh, war with the Germans. And uh, they took about uh, 40 or 50 of us uh, captured that day in a small village. And uh, it was kind of interesting. My best friend was killed right in front of me out there. We were on the Bastogne Highway. And uh, most of the guys got on board the uh, Tiger tanks to go back to their headquarters. And they put me in a jeep, one of our jeeps, someone had taken their rotor out of it. And so they tied a chain between the tank and my jeep. And I drove the jeep with my friend next to me and a German soldier in the back. We went all the way back to their headquarters in the snow. And our own artillery started coming in on us at that time. Anyway, I was in very, a lot of, uh, Stalags, we call it Stalags, German uh, prison camps. I don't know if you want me to go into that or not. Anybody, uh, did you want me to just talk about that? or Briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Briefly. Well, the jug that uh, this gentleman mentioned, that P-47, when I was in uh, a uh, uh, 40 and 8 uh, uh, German uh, boxcar for a week, a hundred of us in there, we had, had to take turns to sit down. And one day we're in a railhead and uh, jugs came through there, the P-47, and blew up the engine and started strafing our cars and killed a lot of our guys. The Germans let us out of the cars, thank God, or I wouldn't be standing here today. And uh, that was one hell of an airplane. And I was on the ground taking those 50 caliber shells. It was awesome. Anyway, from there I, <clears throat> I worked in a German hospital in an operating room for about, uh, for about two weeks. Uh, we got extra food for, for working in the operating room. There were six of us uh, prisoners of war assigned to a uh, surgeon. And what we did was we held down the uh, German soldiers as they had made, did major operations on it. The only thing they had was ether, so you can imagine the pain and the suffering that guy went through. And uh, that was probably one of the worst things I've ever done was to have uh, that happen. I went on a forced march to Bad Orb, Germany, which is called a death camp. It was one of the worst camps that we had in Germany, it was in uh, nine, Stalag 9B, and uh, was I was uh, repatriated by uh, Patton's army, thank God, uh, sometime in May, and uh, returned to the United States. Became an LA cop for 25 years, joined the reserve, stayed in reserve during Korea, Vietnam, I was in Vietnam and Thailand in 1973, and uh, I'm retired as a uh, uh, command sergeant major. I'm very proud of it. And I'm proud of all you veterans out here because you're all heroes. And thanks very much for inviting me to be here. And I'd like to welcome once again from Desert Hot Springs High School, the JROTC Marines, and from Indio High School, their choir. Please rise as we retire the colors.
like to sing America the Beautiful and encourage you to sing with us. for just one moment I've just heard about just right right now a uh, quick last minute addition to today's program I'd like to ask uh, Boy Scout Troop 4029 to come on up are you here all right come on up here I think I mentioned earlier that uh, Mr. Otis Sampson turned 100 years of age just a couple of days ago right Otis was it the 19th your birthday on the 19th, is that correct, sir? Okay, well, we've got a group of young men here that's got a little birthday card for you here. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice in the back we've got a couple of birthday cakes as well. Do you join us? Uh, we'll be having a flight exhibition here on the ramp starting in a few minutes. But grab yourself a slice of cake first. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, enjoy the flight. And don't forget to come back here a little later on in the afternoon, 3 o'clock. We've got another program for you on uh, China Burning India Theater. Thank you all once again.